All right. Good morning and welcome. Speaking of the new normal, it's not it's not a meeting or a press conference without the Allen present. So I'm glad to have all of you here in person and so many more online. I'm Sarah Silverman, the chair of uh, A Plus's Board of Trustees. And it's my honor and pleasure to uh, be able to introduce today's press conference uh, and talk a little bit, very briefly, I promise, about how we, we got here today. Um, as those of you who are in the room probably know well, and, and those who have been attending these uh, press conferences or reading reports of the community may know, when A Plus was started in 2004, it came about because there was a shared collective idea that something needed to be done to draw attention to the, that we needed to pay attention to what was happening in our school system in order to have any hope of making systematic improvement. Over the last 18 years, done a lot of work to try to create that transparency. And over time, it's also become clear that we need to do more than just simply shed light on what's going on, but also participate in the solution. So over the last few years, obviously a few things have happened that have made things pretty challenging for PPS and schools across the country. The data definitely demonstrate that we have struggled here in Pittsburgh, as well as globally, frankly. And it's also made really clear that two things remain true. Number one, it's still really important to have transparency, to pay attention to the data, and to look at it even when it's not particularly pleasant. But also, two, that it's really important that we all work together to bring the solution to bear. So whatever that solution may be, we have to identify it collectively. We have to take action on it collectively. And the only way we can really hope to make progress in terms of student outcomes, in terms of student, uh, student systems improvement, is that we put our heads together, pay attention to this data, and hopefully ask ourselves and each other the question, what can we do together to take action based on that? So as promised, I'm not gonna keep going, but I am gonna turn it over to James Fogarty and thank him for the work that went into the report this year and give him the floor to introduce him. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Uh, we have a packed agenda today, so I'm gonna, um, in a second, I'm gonna do some, do you have to share my screen here? So hopefully the folks at home can see that. Um, so welcome. Um, we'll start today's presentation with a little overview of who A Plus Schools is and why we do this work of the reports of the community as well as why we do the work we do within our schools and with our school communities. Um, we'll pro provide an overview of the data, asking two key questions. How are the children doing? And what can we do about it, right? Um, this is not just about uh, looking at data for data's sake, but actually saying, <clears throat> what can we do to make things better um, as a community in support of our schools? We then have the honor of presenting the A-plus Educator of the Year Award to Westinghouse's Ms. Angela Flango. You'll hear more about her in a bit. And then I'll summarize our key takeaways and act, ask Dr. Wayne Walters, who's here with us, and Nina Esposito Vizcaitis, uh, the president of the PFT, to provide their reflections on what we presented, and then we'll close out. All right, everyone ready? All right, let's go. Um, so the pandemic crystallized for us that at the center of our work, it's not the institution of schools. For so long, our mission was about improving schools and being a watchdog. But really, what we, what we come to know is that children and families are at the center of our work, um, and that the schools have an impact on learning. But what we saw through the pandemic is that there's a lot of other uh, places, organizations, people, parents that uh, also have an impact. And so we wanted to see what could we do as an organization to help knit together the various resources in our community, support children and families in learning. Because our vision has always been a Pittsburgh where every child succeeds, knowing that the education of that child is critical to that success. So during the pandemic, we came up with this new theory of change uh, with about 80 organizations, we're up to nine now in what we're calling the Pittsburgh Learning Collaborative. <laughs> and in that theory of change, we thought, okay, if we could get every school to participate in every child to participate in school and the, that needed one or wanted one and out of school time program, every student reading at grade level, every student that, need, had, that needed a tutor having one, um, and then all the, the resources, whether that be health, right? During the pandemic, it was like making sure you had the vaccine, um, transportation, uh, housing, 
so that they could learn, right? We thought if we could do those things, that would lead to every student graduating ready for college, career, and life. Lately, as we've been doing that work, we've come to understand that the barometer for a lot of that work would be if every child attended every school every day, it would require our community to think really differently about what would it take to get children to school. It would require us to work with schools to see what could you do differently to create a welcoming place where children feel uh, like this is their place where they belong and families feel like they are partners in the work. And three, what would we do to rally this entire community to help? So that's something we're exploring, something we're working on right now, because we really truly believe if we got every child attending every school every day, it would be a measure that would show that we're getting to the kind of excellence that we want for our kids, both in the community, on our streets, but also in our schools. So how do we do the work we do? Well, we do it in kind of four big buckets, right? We start with the students and families, bringing them to the table to understand the problems as they see them um, and, and figure out how we can to work together to solve them. In lots of cases, a lot of the resource issues that families have aren't necessarily school-based. It might be food, it might be housing. Um, so really working to understand what those issues are so that kids are in a stable place so they can be ready to learn. Then we coordinate, right? We coordinate over 90 organizations through the Pittsburgh Learning Collaborative to align our work, all of our work around four focus areas, right? We all have different missions, but we also know that if we want our children to succeed, they have to be able to do those four things that we just talked about. And we want to build out a learning network. Right? We, realize, we realize that learning happens best uh, among people. And, and what we found is just by bringing people together, they realized they didn't know that someone just down the street was doing something where a family of theirs needed help. Right? One of the examples uh, I remember last year was like the summertime, there was a program that was like, we really want to get some of our kids bikes because we know that it would help them get to our program, they're nearby. And another program had bikes to give away, right? So making those connections really helps do the third thing, which is problem solve. We work with those partners, schools, and others around those four focus areas to problem solve. And then we communicate it all out with reports to the community, um, our budget. We've got a budget book, a story of summer, right? We're really trying to help people understand how this community is rallying around our children. Um, my, my son is a big Spider-Man fan right now. So uh, I, we, I use this graphic to just really say, like, we are choosing to stop blaming, right? Um, it does no one any good if we say, well, it's the parents. No, it's the teachers. No, it's our mayor's office. Really, it's all of us have to start working together to solve the common problems that are barriers to our children learning. And we know those barriers aren't just, again, aren't just in the classroom. They're in our entire community. So how do we as an organization support closing those barriers and support our, our schools to get the kind of outcomes that we want for children, which is highly educated kids who are successful in college, career, and life? And solving problems requires that we use data for light, not heat, right? You know, as someone once said, our partners in school and community need to feel safe, right? Learning happens best when we feel safe. Um, and to be honest about what's not working and what and what what will work um, requires us to really look at those problems with with an eye towards solving them. Um, as one ed researcher said, um, everything works somewhere, nothing works everywhere. So we've got to really start to figure out what the context is for the learning. So what's inside the report? Well, we do as we've done the last three years, provide some bright spots. Um, around the data, right? What are, what are some schools that are getting better than expected results? Um, we also share community resources, both in our rising up section and in um, the advertising that was done. The sponsor ads this year are a mix of resources for parents. Almost all of them um, provide a phone number, a program, uh, a link for you to get tutoring, for you to get food, support on housing. So we really hope you, you'll take advantage of the, the ads and look through them and use those numbers. Um, we provide a systems analysis, right? The executive summary, which a lot of what we're going to be talking about today comes from that, um, looks at the data through an equity lens and, and kind of thinks about how we are meeting or not meeting the, the needs of students in an equitable way. School information, right? As we've always done, we provide information school by school that provides key information about the demographics, teacher demographics, uh, the, the, their data, their school data, graduation rate, et cetera. Um, we have a rising up section, which again, tells the story. And this year we're really thankful um, for Dr. Walters for the time he gave us and for the staff at PPS for really explaining how the administration is trying to meet the needs of students in this moment. 
Um, we also provide some information on some tutoring programs and how they're getting success and how they're working to try and link pre-service uh, educators to teaching through tutoring. Um, and then this year, what we did was we decided, you know, we always give all of these facts and numbers. We try to put it all on one page. So we give you facts at a glance that give you some of the key data points that we're tracking that we think uh, demonstrate where equity is. Finally, um, we've started this campaign, What's Your Excuse to Go? on social media. We're encouraging people, and we'll talk about it later, um, to, to tell students what your excuse to go was when you were maybe feeling like not going to school, because we want to encourage every child um, to get to school every day, because we know the default is most children do go every day. Chronic absence is only missing 10% of the school year, right? Um, but if we can get every child excited about going to school, remembering that there's a reason for them to go, we hope that that will also encourage our students to get to school. Finally, I got to do, I got to thank some folks. I uh, thank my board and, and, and Dr. Silverman for being here um, and the board that's board members that are on the call. I want to thank our funders who without, we couldn't do this work. Um, the sponsors, and there's many of them who helped uh, get this book together. Because of their work, we were able to print this book and send it to 15,000 households. That Those will be hitting mailboxes this Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we're actually getting the delivery today. Um, and then they will be, uh, we will have them delivered to over 200 community locations, libraries, pediatric offices, um, magistrate offices, legislator offices, so that folks have access to schools, so that folks have access to them in the community. Um, finally, I want to thank our team, Faye Shots, who's been with us since 2004 for the writing and editing she did, but especially for Rising Up. Sean Caulfield, who is at Baltimore City Public Schools, but stayed with us because he was a Carnegie Mellon student who did our uh, data analysis and continues to do it for a part time. Um, and, and Alec Harkins, also another former Carnegie Mellon grad uh, in their MPA program who, who helped pull the numbers together and make sure we were accurate. Ryan Thompson at A to Z, and Gideon Machulko, who's standing in the back there, who's our director of marketing and publications, who has project managed all of this work um, for us. I want to thank the team at PPS, Dr. Walters, Dr. Dwyer, the Chief Accountability Officer, his team, Sarah Stefanik, who's the Director of the Data Research Evaluation and Assessment Office, Stephen Green and Eric Shepard. They helped us get the numbers from the district, uh, the charters who provided their data, um, the interviewees, um, and Ebony Pugh for doing some reviews and helping uh, coordinate that review process for us. So how are the children? This year, we were lucky to get the Panorama student, social emotional learning student competency and well-being survey data from the district. Uh, talked a lot with Christine Cray about how the district's using this information. They're using it with their um, student leadership group. Um, they're using it with the student support teams to try and understand in the data, what, what, do they, what do they see? And for the most part, sort of a general trend, what we're seeing is students are for the most part feeling safe. Um, the most part feeling like they're, they belong, but there is a chunk of students who are feeling lonely, who aren't feeling loved. And what we have, what we're asking is, what can we do as a community to support those students who are feeling like they're struggling through this moment? Because coming out of the pandemic, we see that our children are resilient. They've had to deal with a once in a hundred year event, and and they've managed it for the most part. They're also got amazing capabilities. Two pictures here. The top right is um, the Genius Love and Joy Scholars out of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, these are students who are going to be educators, who spent their summer uh, learning about what it would mean to be an effective educator in our schools at the University of Pittsburgh. And on the left is Sean Russell, a student from uh, Pittsburgh's Westinghouse, who was admitted to every Ivy and ended up matriculating to Stanford. These are just a few of many examples of students who are doing amazing things in our schools. But let's be real, some are suffering more than others. I want to acknowledge uh, Reverend Brenda Gregg, who's one of our board members who's on the Zoom right now, whose ministry has been impacted by the scourge of gun violence. I also want to say as a father that my heart is breaking for the family that lost their four-year-old late last week. These incidents are hurting our children and impacting their ability to learn. And we know that gun violence in our communities is impacting all of our families. And so if we don't solve that community problem, we also, we also know that we're going to have to solve other problems, right? We have systemic inequities like racial economic seg segregation, right? Our schools are neighborhood-based, and those neighborhoods are segregated, and therefore we have schools that are racially and economically segregated. 
Another challenge our students face is school funding that's not need-based, right? It's more equal than equitable, right? So we see this distribution of school funding that's fairly in a fairly similar range, regardless of the concentration of poverty in the school. We also see disruptions at school, whether it be school violence. I mean, we didn't see as much of an uptick as maybe the press had, had, had shown in, in incidents of violence in our schools, but we know that disproportionality and suspension leads to more of our students of color, especially black students being suspended, right? So that disrupts their learning. We also have a system where economic advantages you're born with become educational advantages, whether that's uh, the number of students that are identified as gifted, when you plot that against the concentration of poverty, you see that more students uh, who are more, the more uh, economic disadvantage increases in the school, the less likely there are students who are going to be identified as gifted. You also see access to algebra um, courses by eighth grade. Um, you see some limitations there, although there's more of a spread, so the correlation is not as strong. Um, and AP course and exam take. These and other issues impact enrollment. Right? We've seen a decline of uh, 3,224 students since 2018, the 2017-18 school year um, in PPS. Um, the impact attendance, right? We see the disparities and differences by race and low income status, IEP, and the differences in grade. We also know that as students get older, um, if they haven't gotten the learning they need in elementary school, they're more likely to lead to miss school uh, in high school. So we see that pattern. And so we're trying to figure out how do we help support student attendance. Um, and also, while we have a, a school system where 91% of teachers say uh, their school is a good place to work and learn, um, we also have some schools where there's a high, higher levels of teacher dissatisfaction, right? <clears throat> and so we know that, that we have to attend to those needs too, because we want, we want a school system where teachers can teach and students can learn. Um, and it also in, impacts our outcomes, right? Like as, as Sarah said, there's not a, um, we are not immune from what happened during the pandemic. We saw declines in student uh, achievement kind of across the board. Um, and as the economic policy, both in, in ELA, English language arts and math, um, as the Economic Policy Institute stated in a recent report, the pandemic has exacerbated well-documented opportunity gaps that put low-income students at a disadvantage relative to their better off peers. That national story is one that's also playing out here in Pittsburgh with declines in proficiency across grade spans that are really consistent with national trends. Um, these issues also impacted grades in high school, although being back in person, right? So these are uh, the percent of seniors who had a 2.8 or higher GPA. Um, this is one of the indicators of college readiness that the district tracks. And, and we see uh, this past year, when children were back in school, increases almost across the board for, for students who, whose uh, GPAs were lower than 2.8, right? But there's still some schools where that's, a couple schools where that's not happening. We wanna make sure that we're encouraging and, and supporting students to be successful in meeting those benchmarks, meaning the benchmarks that are set out in the SAT for college readiness, and the percentage of students who went on to college or trade school after graduation. We, we've seen this 14 point decline in immediate matric matriculation from high school to college. We know the economic impacts uh, of COVID are causing a lot of families to reconsider going to school. We know the cost of college is a huge issue. Um, but we need to go and ask our students who didn't go on to college or trade school last year, what happened? What was the choice behind and how can we support you, right? Because again, once you've graduated our schools, there's a set of workforce and community development organizations out there ready and willing to help students get on the track to college and trade school um, and jobs. And so what can we do to support them? All right. So that and it's what used to be my entire presentation for, for the reports of the community. We used to stop with the data and go there. This year, we want to continue a, a pattern we've, we've created over the past couple of years of what we can do, right? If we think about attendance as the barometer for a lot of issues, we think there's four key areas that we could work on together as a community to really improve student outcomes. One, we believe we can help every child get to school every day. Right? That's a community and school joint project that can actually work to improve outcomes. And if we do that, we believe we can help 95% of our children learn to read, 
We believe we can create a diverse by design school system that includes community voices in how we shape and design and those design principles for the future. And we can get dramatically better through a commitment to continuous improvement that centers respect for any every individual in the system, whether it be teacher, or student, or family. Because I believe we have everything we need to succeed by our children in Pittsburgh, right? We have <clears throat> well-paid teachers, median salaries nearly $100,000 for our teachers, which leads to low teacher turnover compared to other cities, right? If you look at what Philadelphia was facing, New York was facing at the beginning of the school year, Pittsburgh did not face that kind of shortage. Are there still issues with teachers out on leave because they're being sick? Yes. Are there issues with substitutes? Yes. Are there issues in certain uh, subject matter areas? Yes, right? So we, it's not like this says we're solving it all, but compared to other districts, we have a good situation for our teachers. Our funding is solid with over $28,000 in per pupil spending, which ranks 21st out of 500 districts in PA, top 5%. We have a low student teacher ratio, one teacher for every 11 students. That doesn't mean there aren't schools with 20 class sizes of 22, 28, 30 kids. There are. Um, but it does mean we do have we do have a, teachers at a higher rate than other school systems. The national average is 16 to 1. So we've got to start to figure out, okay, so if that if there are differences, if there are disparities, if there are inequities, how are we solving them? And finally, we have abundant community support. So right? Pittsburgh is fourth per capita in philanthropic giving in the United States. Uh, that puts us in a position to um, leverage some, some old dollars to support kids today so that they can be successful. All right, so with that, if I believe, if, if all of those factors are there, I believe we can end chronic absence in Pittsburgh public schools. You know, going back in person has been challenging. 40%, almost 8,300 students missed 10% of school days last year. For almost all of them, that means they missed 18 or more days of school, right? Um, we have another about 3,000 students missed 20% or more, almost seven weeks of school, right? So we know the challenges. A lot of that had to do with COVID, right? Um, and, and people getting sick and needing to stay out. Some of that had to do with housing instability. Some of that had to do um, with folks uh, with folks just missing because they had missed so much the prior year because they had, a, had trouble with online learning, right? So there's a ton of factors that go into that. But we can play a role, right? This is not to say that this is hopeless. It's actually, I believe there's a, there's a path forward outside of the school district where the community can do more. Right? And we know there are kind of four areas around which that if we were to attend to, we could get better. Right, In healthcare, an estimated 14 million school days is lost in this country every year due to asthma. If we manage chronic illness, provide dental care, regular checkups, and access to doctors so that students don't feel like they have to use the emergency department for their medical needs, we can reduce the amount of time students are out of school. If we have better transit options, 42% of Black families in the city don't have regular access to a car. Right, so how do we provide public transit that actually connects to schools? We know that there's issues in, in policy around that right now. How do we solve those issues? We know that stable housing is a huge part of our killed children getting to school. Our friends at the Homeless Children's Education Fund pointed this out, that in the data that the district provides to the public, 87% of students who experienced homelessness during the last school year were chronically absent, right? Because once you miss school, because you have to find a new place, or maybe you're sleeping on a couch, um, it's hard to get reconnected, right? And so that time to get reconnected, the time to get the resources to get to school um, is long. If we kept people in housing and had housing advocates in our city making sure that children weren't evicted, that families weren't evicted, we can ensure that we reduce chronic absence. And then safe streets, right? The city, we're working with the city right now up in the hilltop neighborhoods to try and address some issues of safe streets so that kids that have to walk to Arlington can get there safely. Um, we know Johns Hopkins had a study that's, that looked at um, violence in a community and if increases in community violence have increases in chronic absence. What could we do to police in a way that's actually uh, ethical and mindful of our families, uh, but also create safe areas so the children will get on the bus and not just stay home? We can also support school, right? Again, this is about being aligned with what schools need. Community organizations can help create a sense of belonging in schools, right? We as organizations that work in the community know our communities and families. We can work with our schools to help them get to know our neighborhoods, the issues, our diverse families, and create opportunities for appreciation and partnership. Lawrenceville's pet program, is, Lawrenceville United's pet program is one such example uh, of that, but we know there are others like the Home of Children's Village and others. 
We can solve problems together, right? We can look at the aggregate data, identify areas where family might need extra, families might need extra support and think creatively. This is something we're doing collectively with the Bashir Association, with folks from the Lighthouse uh, Church uh, and the School of Arlington, the leadership of the School of Arlington, the city of Pittsburgh, to try and figure out how can we help support that school to reduce its chronic absence. Home with Children's Village is also doing that with supports at Lincoln, Faison, and Westinghouse. We can finally communicate in the line, right? Parents, one study out of Harvard showed that parents underestimate by half the number of school days we miss, right? So one of the things we're doing is we partnered with Everyday Labs to support the district in communicating out to parents when their child misses school so that they know ahead of time that their child is on track to being chronically absent. We also are doing campaigns like Excuse to Go to ensure that folks have um, better information. We also figured we should ask our students what they, what they think. Um, and our, our team block students provided a peer perspective, right? And on the top, you can see uh, reasons why students miss school, right? These are students' own words. I was discouraged or stressed by mental health issues, bullying or tearing people down. But what motivates them to go? Friends, arts and media, classes that teach about real life living. Right, we gotta listen to those words and then figure out how do we design a system that reduces those barriers and increases the outcomes, especially for our high school students. Again, bright spots in this, you know, Manchester Academic Charter saw a 6% uh, rate of chronic absence last year. Schiller is still the lowest in the district, though higher than it normally is coming back from the pandemic at 10% and Montessori at 11. Right? What are these schools doing that helps their children get to school? Right? Is it the, the families have other advantages? Is that the only issue? Is there um, practices that the schools are, are undertaking? You can read tw our 2019 report to the community. It's at ourschoolspittsburgh.org where you can find today's version, and there's a story about uh, what Schiller is doing and how they've reduced chronic absence significantly at the school. I believe we can teach, as the research says, we can teach 95% of children to read proficient. Um, one of the things we looked at the data this year by chronic absence, last year we kind of plotted schools' ac academic achievement on PSSA tests by economic disadvantage. We wanted to see, well, what does chronic absence tell us? If, you're, if you have more chronic absence, we thought you would have uh, lower, lower student achievement. While the trend is certainly there, it's not highly correlated, which gives me some hope, right, in, the, in our younger grades, because it means something's happening in the instruction, something's happening in those school communities that creates that variability that allows us to look. And when we look at the dots sort of that are sort of high, but high chronic absence, we see, um, you know, what's happening in Greenfield, right? We want to know what's going on there, right? Is it just community factors that are part of it? Is there something happening in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade that's leading to 88% of the third graders at Greenfield scoring proficient and advanced in 2022? Right, this is coming out of the pandemic. We also wanna know Fulton, same thing. You know, you're seeing very low um, achievement gaps between black and white students, but there's gotta be something happening at that school. Is it the instruction saying probably yes? Is it something that's happening in the community or the parents? Probably yes, but we don't know that, right? And so we've got to do a better job. So next year, one of the things we're going to do with our Rising Up stories is go and go and see, go and see what's happening and understand, because we know that systemically we've got a lot of work to do. So Mississippi uh, is is a state that I want to point out as as an example of, of something of, of what we could be doing, and I'm proud to say that the district is is looking at an approach very similar to this. Right in 2003, Mississippi was one of uh, the states at the bottom for Black student uh, student achievement on the national report card, the NAEP. Um, by last year, even with the pandemic, they were in the top five of states. Right out of 40 states and, and, and localities that had significant numbers of Black students, by which we could make a judgment. Right. So what did they do? Right. What what did this what did this state do? Well. They, they did what the National Reading Panel in the year 2000, and so 22 years ago, um, a group of experts uh, chartered by Congress came together to say, what could we be doing about reading? And they came, they have five pillars of, of, of literacy. And they, in Mississippi, started training teachers in those five pillars of literacy that you see here. Phonetic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension, right? Um, these are all fancy sounding words, but it's really about how we read, not guess. Um, and they provided state training, state trained coaching and support to their district leaders. They said which curricula is more likely to get you better results than not. And they made sure that they had evidence-based curricula that, that districts had. 
Um, and I want to say, I've been sitting as part of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, and one of the things that the district is looking at is moving in this direction, making sure that we're taking a science of reading approach, making sure that our materials are aligned, um, and making sure that the training and professional development is provided to our teachers so that we can increase reading proficiency across the board. The other thing we're trying to do is support families and community organizations with resources through pghreads.com. We came together with Open Literacy and Boom Concept to create fun videos that you can do with your family that teach phonemic awareness um, because we know it's highly linked to later school achievement um, in a culturally responsive way. Um, you can go to pghreads.com and if you're sitting on the bus, these are short 10 minute videos where you can uh, learn about a letter, its sounds, and how you can blend those sounds together. Because we know if we don't do take an all-in approach, kids who struggle to read by third grade will continue to struggle without strong instruction and supports. One study showed that 20, less than 20% of third graders who were reading proficiently by third grade went on to attend college. And so we know that it's so important that we help give our students a strong foundation and work with tutoring programs and others to support our older students who may need some more foundational supports to be able to meet the, the challenge and rigor of their high school courses. We can end school segregation in Pittsburgh. Part of the story around attendance and reading is systemic. We continue to have highly segregated schools based on the segregation of our neighborhoods. Here's one example. Whittier and Grandview are two schools less than two miles away from each other. One serves a predominantly white student body and the other serves a predominantly a uh, student body that are students of color. Um, you can see from these, map, from these maps though, they also mirror the, the segregation in our neighborhoods. Those blue dots are, are white families, uh, white households in, in the area, and those orange dots are black households, right? So the segregation patterns that we see in our neighborhoods are mirrored again in our school boundary lines. Um, so what could we do? What would it take to bridge the divide between these two, two communities? Because right now, you could fit the student populations of both of these schools in either of the buildings, right? Based on the district's own evaluation of building capacity. Um, what I would argue is if we brought these two communities together, um, using, a, using a strategy similar to what Baltimore did with its 10-year plan to renovate and, and design 21st century schools, we have a model there of community engagement, state investment, um, and, and, and design that's renovating schools. Um, and they built 23 new or re fully renovated schools. At the same time, they closed some schools that they knew they weren't going to be able to renovate well, right? Again, they, but they did it in a way, they did it with their sports exhibition authority and their governor's office to provide a billion dollars in capital improvements because they knew doing capital improvements in a one-off way in a piece-by-piece in a -piece way wasn't going to get them where they needed to be. What if we did that here in Pittsburgh? We can make Pittsburgh's public schools the best places to learn and work. Some of you may have heard of continuous improvement, and it's an idea that we can use a scientific method to understand the processes and systems that impact, sorry, I'm just checking time because I got Ms. Flango coming in on her break, uh, <laughs> that uh, impact uh, the ability of an organization to meet its goals, right? And, and what are our goals here in Pittsburgh? In our case, it's creating schools where teachers can teach and students can learn. And, and guess what? Schools that systems that focus on a process of continuous improvement can make dramatic changes quickly, right? It sounds like an incremental approach, but the fact is when we unlock the potential of every employee, and I mean every employee, to support and provide feedback, we actually can accelerate these small tests of change into large scale systems improvement. And I provide two examples from our budget book that we created a uh, year and a half, two years ago now, um, one from Birmingham City Schools and one from Cincinnati Public Schools. In Birmingham, this is a district that in 2016-17, the district received an F grade on its state issued report card. It had 22 F rated schools with a 65% graduation rate. By 2018-19, this district had improved to a C grade on that state report card, only six F rated schools and a 79% graduation rate. Again, leveraging a process of continuous improvement, a model by, whereby every single employee was empowered to say what's not working, what is, which requires safety, right? We gotta feel safe to do that. We gotta feel like there's a place where we can share problems openly and learn. Cincinnati did the same in partnership with their children's hospital, right? 
They, they wanted to improve third grade reading proficiency. In 2015-16, 46% of their third graders were reading proficiently. By 2018-19, just four years later, three years later, well, four years later, time, time, by the time it gets to the end, uh, they had a 66% third grade reading proficiency rate, right? Um, no longer considered an underperforming district. They scaled from, from one little, small literacy pilot with two teachers in one school to five elementary schools serving 11,000 children, and they focused on literacy, math, SEL, and absenteeism. Because at the end of the day, at its core, continuous improvement is about respect. Um, Paul O'Neill has these three R's that he talked about when he was doing the work at Alcoa to reduce uh, accidents from, from a high rate to near zero. And it's these three R's are respect, respecting each individual and their dignity as a human being, no matter where, where they come from, who they are. Um, I mean, providing the resources, supports, education, within the system that you have so that everyone feels like they, they can do their job well. And then it's recognizing that good work that everyone else does, right? If we take a continuous improvement approach, modeling how to, to leverage the data that we do have in a way to solve problems on the ground, we can get there. About two minutes, I got a vamp for two minutes. Uh, Ms. Flango, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lead in uh, with the A plus schools 22 educator of the year, um, and I'm hoping uh, that she will jump jump right in uh, right at the right moment. Uh, um, we've come to know Ms. Flango's work through her participation in the Justice Scholars Institute, a program at the University of Pittsburgh that's working hand in hand with our schools to give children early college access. Right, typically early college access was something that occurred. Uh, here? All right, great. Um, in only schools where kind of students were ready for it. Uh, the Justice Scholars Institute took the approach that um, we need to do we need to do both and. And so in schools where students might not um, have been ready, we wanted to put this program in and make sure that we were providing the scaffolded supports to do it. Ms. Blaine was a big part of the success of the Justice Scholars Institute at um, Westinghouse High School. I'd like to now invite her colleague, Sean Means, and I'm gonna turn off my screen sharing so uh, we can see whose eloquent letter to us earlier this year was the inspiration for this year's award. Um, Mr. Means. Yeah. All right, mic check. Mic check, can you hear me? Okay, so a couple of years ago, our school was in a different place. Like most summers, I found myself shuffling through a mountain of resumes, assist assisting our administration in filling open teacher positions. One day, I came across a, res a resume from Richmond, a newest teacher from Penn State who had worked in South Korea. Her name was Ms. Flango. She seemed like a good fit, so I gave her a call. During the conversation, one of the things that I could hear is that she had a mindset that would serve our children well. I quickly told our, our administrator, Dr. Taylor, hey, you should give her a ring. He did so, and that was a win for our school. She has been a valuable resource within our ELA department Justice Scholars Program, but most importantly, she has been a indispensable part of our students' lives. One of our slogans in the Justice Scholars Program is, it's a culture, not a class. For instance, Ms. Flango is currently sitting beside her JSI debate class, part of the 12th grade cohort. They're taking a break now to celebrate her accomplishment, but most days they'll be writing. Now I'll be honest, they're not always pumped for the grind, all right? Sometimes you gotta you know, push Linmar a little bit, make sure he's awake. Other days you gotta make sure Quay is on task and not in some one of the newest high school dramas, all right? But they're kids. This is what's supposed to happen. The class is rigorous. It's a lot of work, but the students know she's doing it for the right reasons. They respect her and they'll rise to the occasion when asked. Last year, our college and high school seniors completed 100% of their 15-page research papers. Like Jimmy the Cricket, Ms. Slango was there to guide them throughout the entire process. As a planner, she is ready with step-by-step -step instructions, tailored scaffolds, and timely feedback. Her guidance through this and other writing ventures has helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for children who needed every single cent for college. And just so you know, 
this year's senior group is ready to run it back 100%. All right, put that in writing. Such a feat is only achievable through a collective effort of authentic relationships and mutual investment. The teacher's belief in the students, but more importantly, the student's belief in that teacher. I often call her the mother goose of our hall because she has an ability to chat with and reach any student from any background on any academic level. I cannot tell you the number of letters or recommendations she's written, the lunches she's given up so that our students can vent, laugh, or just talk about their day. Our stu students want, no, no, our students need to be in her space. As I wrote the first draft of this nomination, I was a few miles above the earth. Sean Russell was in the seat next to me, knocked out, drooling. He was all tuckered out from our, our trip to Stanford. But we didn't have much time to sleep when we got back because we had to jump on another plane to Boston. While she wasn't physically with us on these trips, these opportunities would not have been occurred without her efforts. She helped Sean with his application essays, his personal statement, and his valedictorian speech. She was responsible for our trip's agenda, composing spreadsheets and detailed itineraries. And she also coordinated all of our accommodations. Trust me, you didn't want me in charge of all that plan. It would have been a totally different situation. In closing, Pittsburgh Westinghouse is lucky to have Ms. Fling on his roster. I am proud of my colleague. She is the teacher every parent wants for their child. She represents everything that's good in education. Congratulations, Ms. Flango. You are the teacher of the year. Hey, congratulations, Ms. Flango. We really appreciate you. So I will be uh, delivering this uh, plaque and a $100 gift card for you uh, later this week uh, to Westinghouse. Um, and we just wanna say thank you so much. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, A Plus Schools, for choosing me among the many uh, amazing teachers in the in the city, uh, in the area. Um, I'm truly honored to accept it. Um, and thank you, Mr. Sean Means, for those humbling, kind, generous words. Um, and I really just want to say, um, you know, my students are the best parts of every day. And I'm very lucky to have a job that I love coming to every day. And so I want to say thank you. I have a few students in here with me right now. Um, I want to say thank you to all my students, the ones that I've had before, the ones that I have now, the ones that I'll have in the future. Um, I always tell the kids, once you're my kid, you're always my kid. Um, and, and I mean that. So they don't always make it easy, but they definitely always make it worth it. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Ms. Blanco. All right. Guys, I hope you're seeing the clapping uh, for you. Can I, uh, let me just share my screen. All right. So what do I want you to take away from today? This presentation on your Um, all right, so let's remember our students are resilient with amazing capabilities. Some are suffering more than others with COVID-19 impacting student achievement of low income students of color more. They face systemic inequities like racial economic segregation, school funding that's more equal than equitable. I don't know who's drawing uh, <laughs> on the thing, but uh, uh, disproportionate discipline and unequal access to opportunities. Um, we have everything we need to succeed by our children. And we suggest that there are four things communities and schools can prioritize now to make a huge difference, right? We can end chronic absence. We can get 95% children reading at grade level. We can end school segregation in Pittsburgh. And we can make Pittsburgh schools the best places to learn and work. With that, I'd like to turn it over and, and appreciate your patience and indulgence to Dr. Wayne Walters, superintendent of Pittsburgh Public Schools, to be immediately followed by Nina esposito uh, the president of the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers. Dr. Walters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. And I too want to congratulate Ms. Flango from Pittsburgh Westinghouse for as she is one of our many game changers that transform the lives of our children every day. So again, congratulations, Ms. Flango. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge the board members who are with us virtually. We have on the call, President Salah Udin, Pamela Harbin, 
and Dr. Tracy Reed. So I want to just welcome them to the space and to acknowledge them as they're with us today. Thank you to James Fogarty and A Plus Schools for compiling this year's report and its commitment to providing the Pittsburgh community with a snapshot of school performance since 2004. Since then, the report has developed to go beyond the test scores to provide a comprehensive view of school progress and highlight examples of real-time solutions happening in schools across our district right now. The report calls out bright spots in the data, such as Pittsburgh Schiller that was previously mentioned, whose 28% growth in enrollment since 2017 demonstrates what can happen when you revamp a school program to provide an attractive offering to families led by strong leadership and dedicated educators and staff. The school also shows what can happen when staff partner with families to improve student attendance. The rising up section of the report tells the story of the complex work underway to meet the mental health needs of our students and implement social emotional learning. These are examples of what you will learn in this year's report. We also appreciate the focus on equity in this year's report, as we own our existing inequities. As a district, we are currently challenged to improve student achievement and eliminate racial disparities significantly. However, with the collaboration with our board of directors, I've identified five priority goals for improving culture, systems, and instruction to address this challenge. The first, to invest in culturally responsive, evidence-based training, tools, and instructional practices to transform the lives of our students. Two, to construct safety, health, and wellness protocols, as those definitions have changed dramatically since the pandemic. It is no longer just about school safety. It's not just about COVID mitigation. We have social emotional challenges, mental health challenges, food security challenges, and the list goes on and on. Want to expand stakeholder communication and partnership as trust is key in moving us forward. And I believe in the power of partnerships and effective communication to transform what people believe about our district and to truly formulate trust. Four, design effective organizational systems. Without systems, we seem disheveled, we seem not well constructed, and we seem poorly implemented. So that's important. And the fifth one is to strategically allocate resources to ensure what I call the three E's, equity, excellence, and efficiency. Implementation of these priorities will involve a period of inquiry which gathers the input of all stakeholders, so stay tuned. And the conclusions that emerge from this inquiry will push and inform the development of a new strategic plan to solve all challenges with student experiences and outcomes. So together, 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 with a solutions-focused approach, we can develop a plan that ensures all students, regardless of zip code, receive the high quality, robust, educational experience they deserve. Thank you. Hello and good morning, everybody. My name is Dean Escobedo Viscaitis and congratulations, Angela. That's fantastic. What a great honor. And Sean, your nomination was absolutely beautiful. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you so much to James Fogarty and A Plus School for inviting me today. I'm always so excited to be part of this important discussion. And I want to say this call of action for everything that has happened for years. I do consider this a very important call of action because, particularly after watching what has happened to our schools in our district and across the country over the past three years, particularly after acknowledging that a student spends listen, this only 13% of their time from birth to age 18 in schools over their first 18 years of life. James hit, James hit the nail on the head when I read that on the first page of his letter. Quote, if there's only one thing we can say with certainty, it's that in this work, 
We know that the success of all of our children takes more than just one family, one school, one organization, one neighborhood. It takes all of us. And it truly is true. Bravo, James. Collaboration truly is the key. And I was pleased that the report hits on so many topics that I hear from educators constantly. They listed in their wish list as needs in order to effectively partner with the families of their students. And as you can see, when I, as I was listening today, I kept making changes in my notes because so much of what you said today hit home with me, hit my heart. And I heartily agree with your plan and the PFT is in. And it goes so closely with our community school model that nine of our schools are presently involved with. Bravo, bravo to you. I list just a few examples and uh, Dr. Walters talked about communication and how the board is that's one of his goals. And we have already worked, we work together and separately on this. Just one example of that, the board and the PFT has worked over the past two summers door knocking to reach out to parents. And I know you've done this too, at Perry and Arlington and maybe some other schools too, where we go out and talk to parents about the great things happening to see if they have questions about our schools because they want, we want them to hear right from us, not what you might hear on the news, but hear from us about the great things happening in our schools every day and to ask questions directly from our teachers because we know that they love to hear directly from teachers. So teachers are going out the door knocking and the students love to see their teachers. Some of the kids sometimes even get in the car. They wanna get in the car, but they get so excited about seeing the teachers over the summer. So we know that's so important. Um, and we did let them know about supports that work. And that's what was so exciting about enlisting the support to the Pittsburgh Public Schools, giving them the listing, the, the supports how they can access them and a, a great listing of them. I mean, that, that was a great resource that I will certainly keep also. I love it. And the tutoring supports available and where they can turn to. I love that you talked about diversity in our teaching force, which is something that pains me and I know pains a lot of educators. This has hit an emergency status in our, in our teaching force. Uh, it embarrasses me that over half of the schools in Pennsylvania don't have teachers of color. That is half of the schools in Pennsylvania. Our students, all of our students, deserve to see teachers that reflect the population of our country. Pittsburgh has, at 16%, is second in the state to Philly. And some people celebrate that. I don't think that's anything to celebrate. I think, it's, once again, it's nothing to be proud of. We're urban, we should be much higher. The district makes great efforts at recruiting diverse candidates. We have a wonderful teaching academy in Brashear and an agreement with the district to hire back students of that academy if they go through a teaching um, uh, in college and they, and they reach a certain standard, they can come back and teach with us. But other people snatch them into other professions, which is sad. Uh, something is not working. We have the PST runs an African-American teaching mentorship program. Something's not working. We need to do better. We need more diversity at our, uh, in our workforce. I appreciate also how James and A plus school also stressed the importance of attendance. That is so key. It goes without saying the student can't learn if they're not in their seats. And attendance is a constant lament that I hear from both our teachers and paraprofessionals. We really need your help. Our teachers are split in so many directions. They need the students in their uh, uh, seats so they can teach them. I also appreciate that James and A-plus also talks about supports for our educators, which is key. Over the past three years, we have lost 300,000 teachers across the country, which has added to the teacher shortage, which is also severe in some states. Unfortunately, those shortages are hitting Pennsylvania, along with shortages in paraprofessionals, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and custodians. These are also key in our schools. We need every one of these to make our schools work and to support our students. 
This is another issue we must tackle together. But as Jane said, working together, we can do this for our kids. And I know we will, knowing we have groups like A plus and everyone working together. So thank you for this boost. And I look forward to working with you for our students. Thank you. All right, folks. So what can you do next? Um, you can get more information uh, at ourschoolspittsburgh.org. Oh, I need to share my screen. I'm sorry. I need to share my screen. Should have had All right. For those, for those on Zoom. Um, you can get more information today at ourschoolspittsburgh.org. The report is there, available and ready for download. Um, we'll have some additional stories from the Rising Up section going up later this week. Um, we had too many to be able to print. Um, so those will be going up. Um, you can contact us on ourschoolspittsburgh.org. You can contact us to schedule a presentation to your community. We can tailor it to the schools in your neighborhood um, and talk to you a little bit more about um, the work we're doing uh, both at Perry and Arlington as pilots this year to understand how community organizations can partner well with schools. Um, you can get your organization involved. If you run an uh, out-of-school time organization, if you run a neighborhood community, community development organization, you can join the Pittsburgh Learning Collaborative and, and give and get uh, information and resources about how we can serve children and their learning better. And finally, you can share your excuse to go to school on social media. Um, you'll probably see an ad. If you're on TikTok, there's one that'll pop up. Uh, Facebook, share your excuse to go. We'll have more information, toolkits available. There's some on our website as well. Um, but we just want you to, to help our students understand that every day, we know it's hard to get to school every day, um, but if they can find that excuse to go, that they, they'll be able to, to get to school on time every day. That, I think this is, I think this is all I got. Let's see, let me just see if I got any more slides. Yeah, that's it. So thank you so much. I, we appreciate the press in the room. Look, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna shut down the Zoom because um, we know you, you all have questions, um, allow press to, to ask questions sort of after the fact. And we appreciate you um, joining us today for this conference. And uh, thank you so much. We're really excited for the launch. We hope you'll read it. Um, again, families, you'll, you should be seeing this in your inboxes, uh, your mailboxes, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week. And then community organizations will get deliveries next Monday. Um, our whole staff will be uh, out and about dropping these off uh, across the community. So thank you again. We appreciate you being here um, and look forward to the work we do uh, in this coming year. Have a good day.